Passive House. That's one of my favorite topics because it's really important, particularly multifamily projects that save energy over a long period of time for owners. We, we've got two owners and one of the leading professionals in the field, one actually one of the founders of, of Passive House in this country, Katrin Klingenberg here from uh, the Passive House Institute US, or how do you say it? Fias or Fias, uh, Katrin? Fias. Fias like okay. Prius, right? Like <laughs> we, we, like we want to be... Prius. We want to be the Prius of the building industry. All right. <laughs> also with me is uh, uh, Christoph Stump. Uh, he's a member of the AIA and vice president of design and construction at Trinity Financial in New York. And from Hawaii, uh, we have Sloan <laughs> Ritchie. He was a Passive House certified builder and, uh, uh, and president of uh, Cascade Built, uh, based in Seattle. Uh, who's done, and those two uh, developers have uh, have been and are doing some really interesting projects. But Katrin, set the set the stage for us a little bit. Um, what is what is special about Passive House, and what Fias is doing that's particular? Because you've got some competing organizations. Just tell us, give us the background, and tell us about you know the, the money part of this thing. Uh, yeah, everybody sure. says everybody says these things cost too much. Tell us tell us the truth. Well, um, it is really what you want because Passive House is uh, truly the best high quality building, resilience, comfort, uh, good indoor air quality, all that good stuff, right? So uh, originally it came, uh, or was um, started in Germany. The original Passive House standard was uh, configured in a primarily heating dominated climate and quickly became very successful. People started to realize the, mm -hmm. the benefits of passive building. And uh, then we tried to adopt the same standard in North America. And we very uh, quickly learned that there are different climate requirements. And uh, so FIAS actually found itself in a position where uh, we were the first ones to develop a climate-specific passive building standard. That means that uh, not only heating was a considerable concern, but also cooling and also humidity. And uh, while in Germany they had only one design criteria, the heating target to uh, design to, we also had to design to uh, to cooling targets. So, and those so cooling for, targets originally so for, didn't exist. So for Christoph and, and Sloan, Christoph is doing buildings primarily in the New York metropolitan area and Sloan's do, working in Seattle. We've got two different climatic conditions there and um, FIAS works for both. Yeah, exactly. So we, mm -hmm. we adopted two uh, climates that have heating and cooling uh, mm -hmm. concerns and mm -hmm. the sweet spot is elsewhere. Uh, it's different from like just a heating dominated climate. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the big complaint that we're hearing you you just did a, a paper on on the business case and uh, uh for 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 passive house and you found that uh, you know the the premium if there is any is really not what we were i i often compare it to well go ahead tell us what it is uh, well, right now we're very reliably coming in at about like 2% additional cost. Now that is not over like a worst building you're allowed to build by code. Uh, that is what most developers are already building because they're building decent buildings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, to go to passive uh, standards, passive building standards, it really doesn't take that much. It takes attention to detail and it takes changing certain uh construction techniques that one has accustomed to, but it's really not a big deal. Yeah. And in terms of cost, really uh, 2% is almost cost neutral as far yeah. as I'm concerned. Yeah, I, I, I often compare it to the, you know, 20 years ago when we were writing about the early days of lead and, and you know, everybody was saying, oh, you know, 30, 40, 50% more. Uh, and that quick, you know, some of them were uh, that expensive, but it quickly came down to, you know, started coming down to 5% and 4%. Mm -hmm. And now it's, you know, Basically, you just do it. Okay. So, Christoph, thank you for setting that up for us, uh, Katrin. And uh, congratulations on uh, all your work over the last many, many years in uh, in Passive House. Uh, Christoph, tell us about Trinity Financial's projects. You've got uh, 425 Grand Concourse in the Bronx, which is completed. We wrote about that four years ago. We were hoping we, you were going to get it done. And you've got a couple of others that are in the works. So tell us about these these projects. Yeah, I'm going to primarily talk about uh, 425 Grand Concourse, which really is uh, Trinity's first uh, completed and it's also the largest CS certified passive house. Um, it's a 26 story building, and um, the interesting part here is uh, we have a 
178 million total development cost building, and you're always being asked as a developer, well, how much does it cost? What is really the, the quote unquote passive house premium? And um, I'm, we're not going to explain what passive house exactly is, but there you know, are roughly three categories that, that quote unquote add cost to a standard building, which is the envelope. You put a little more effort into uh, making this building airtight, a lot of steel and very good windows and you know certain products for uh, avoiding thermal breaks. Uh, you have uh, added cost in the HVAC area. You're using uh, systems that recover energy, right, from your ventilation, but potentially also in your heating and cooling, you can recover energy there too, or even in the wastewater, other projects do that. Um, and then you have additional costs in the quality control, and that's a big um, uh, a fear, but it's actually a huge benefit um, because the quality control just ensures me, just as Katrin uh, mentioned this, if I get a passive house, I know I'm going to end up with a very high quality building. So when you ask about premium, you know, all of these three items uh, itself we found is about, you know, maybe 1% of total development cost each on this building. It, overall, uh, we, the added cost for passive house was maybe 2.5% of total development, development cost. Uh, so it's about, you know, three three and a half million dollars. But then on the other side, you see the energy savings. Now the cost goes to the, to the overall building. The energy savings will also measure for the total building. And it's a little more complicated. I can you know, tell you what we expect in energy savings for the total building. We think we're um, you know, probably about two thirds uh, less energy intensive than a standard building. So our costs are going to be only one third of the utility cost of a standard building. Right. Uh, and, and, and for this building, we expect that we save annually six to seven hundred thousand dollars. So you weigh that against the, you know, so in, 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 in a few years, in a few years, in a few years, the owner is making the money back. That's that's the story. Seven seven years, maybe mm -hmm. I don't know, but you also get a much better quality building, and there's other benefits. You get the health benefits, right? You get uh, fresh filtered indoor air. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a very silent building. We're building in New York City. It's a loud environment. You know, there's there's really health uh, benefits that go beyond just the uh, uh, dollars versus dollars. Yeah, yeah four twenty five is into your finances. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and you've got a couple of other projects going. You've got, uh, and by the way, that won a, a NYSERDA award, uh, which is the big uh, energy group in uh, energy, uh, state energy ed agency in, in New York. But you've got uh, uh, another project in Mount Vernon, New York called 20 South Second, and that's 320 units. You've got a, a Brookfield Commons Phase 3 in White Plains going on. That's 174 units. And both of those are all electric, uh, which is very interesting, yeah. isn't it? Uh, I, Katrin, how many? What are you seeing? All electric coming along on other FIAS projects? Yeah, well, actually, um, so uh, we're updating our standards every three years, and our latest edition uh, for FIAS zero certification is actually uh, requiring electrification. And for those that are still allowed to use gas, that we we require them to uh, come up with a plan over time to be able to electrify. Okay, let's uh, let's let's bring Sloan in here and uh, uh, switch to the other side of the country uh, uh, to Seattle, where you do most of your work. Sloan, we'll, we'll come back to uh, uh, Brookfield and um, Twenty South Second uh, in a second, uh, uh, Christoph. But tell us about tell us about uh, Solis on Capitol Hill in Seattle and uh, your other two projects that are in the works. Uh, uh, 24th and Union and Pax Futura, Sloan. Sure, you bet. Uh, so Pax Futura was our first um, uh, apartment that was uh, FIAS certified. Um, Solus was the next one in line. And then currently in construction, we have the 24th and Union project. And we've sort of been scaling up. Um, the Pax Futura was, is a 35 unit building with uh, mm -hmm. some commercial space. Um, as four story wood construction, um, and that was a good place for us to sort of uh, test out some of the things we've been learning over the years and, and, and scale yeah. it up to an apartment scale. And it worked uh, very nicely. And so we've applied it to several other projects uh, since. 
Um, Solus is uh, 45 units with um, a level of commercial and a parking garage below that. Um, and that one, we actually sold that building um, a number of years ago. So it's mm-hmm. operating and, and, and doing great over there in Capitol Hill. Very cool, um, very cool, cool mural on the front of that building. That's uh, the Amaterasu by Finn yeah. DAC out of uh, Finland, I guess. Very, very cool uh, design there. Uh, and then you've got 24th and Union at, in Seattle Central District, and you're, now you're over 100 units. Yeah, so that's 107 units, and that's in the Central District. It's a very walkable, great little neighborhood. Um, and we're doing our build to the passive house standard with. Um, keeping our costs pretty minimal and, and, you know, we're, we're hitting what uh, Katrin is, is seeing in the sort of 2% cost range. Um, and, well, uh, let, let me ask, let me ask both of you and then, and, and Katrin though, on that question, uh, mm-hmm. you, you know, 2%. Okay. You know, for, for Christoph's $178 million project in New York, two, two, three percent is, you know, like millions of dollars. Uh, uh, for you, it, it's a little, it's a little bit less loan. Uh, but you know, d- is that, is that a turnoff to developers? Just, you know, Oh, you, you can't even be 2%. It's gotta be zero. Uh, I think uh, it probably is a turnoff to some developers who mm-hmm. would want to remove any and all costs, no matter what, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's sort of a, a, a broad range of developers with, a, with a broad range of goals and aspirations. And some people like to, build buildings as cheaply as possible to sell them quickly. Uh-huh. Um, and, and, and they probably are going to be probably the last ones to get on board, but other developers may have more of a vision of the future and can see this as a competitive advantage and simply just a quality way to build buildings. Uh, you know, well, in the Seattle market, we've got, you know, quite a bit of moisture, you know, it just kind of rains all the time and uh, building to the passive house standard means I've got an airtight and watertight building, which is a um, pretty nice way to sleep at night, knowing that, that my building is airtight and watertight. And that's just, yeah. a, you know, it's, it's you're future proofing your building. Yeah. Um, good point. Speaking of, you, you know, utilities like Christoph was talking about, um, you know, I just read this morning that uh, Texas is going to see a 70% increase in utility costs uh, this year to due to volatile energy markets. Hawaii just booked a 30% uh, utility cost increase this year. And if energy is going to become volatile, I'd much rather be at the low end of the scale, not needing to worry about yeah. uh, huge energy price increases. So th- these are like sort of yeah. future okay. things that may not be true today, but are becoming true in markets across the U.S. And, and Christoph, your, your, uh, your Brookfield Commons Phase 3 in, in White Plains, that's partly public housing, right? You got public housing and affordable in there. Correct, yeah. So is that what the public housing agency in White Plains is uh, are you doing that? Yes, correct. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so they're the kind and of client. They're the kind of client who wants a building that's going to last fifty years, right? Uh, we do. We hold on to our buildings, um, and you know, it's more and more. You brought up utility rates, but there's also legislation that uh, pushes you into the direction of um, uh, uh, utility uh, uh, um, conservation. Uh, in New York, we have the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act requires the entire state economy to become carbon neutral by 2050 um, with steps. And then you have on the other side, you also have uh, lenders who are going to more and more look at the risks of investing, uh, uh, lending to a project or investing into a project that might be exposed to uh, volatile utility rates. So you, you have to look into how do you reduce that risk um, and part of it is we're going all electric, so the utility risk on electricity is very high. You have to conserve more and more, so we're going to go beyond just uh, 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 recovering energy from the heating and ventilation system on the heating and cooling system. Uh, we're going to look at uh, recovering energy from the waste heat. Uh, we're going to have to produce energy on site, really reduce the loads uh, that we have in the buildings and reduce uh, the load on the grid and uh, reduce right. utility rate staffing. All right, Katrina is shaking her head and I know she's she's got something to say here about what you two have been talking about. Go ahead, Christian. No, 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 I, w- I was agreeing. Like this, is, this, is all, this all makes perfect <laughs> oh, sense. And well, I, I would also add that the resilience factor and market demand, you know, people people understand what these buildings are about and they, they are starting to ask for passive apartments. Yeah. I would love to live in one in Chicago. I can't, I can't have one because they don't exist yet. Yeah, <laughs> well, there are six. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
and and you've got state programs coming along, uh, Katrin, with uh, the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center Pub Passive Housing Design Challenge and the NYSERDA Buildings of Excellence Competition. That's the one that uh, uh, Trinity won for the uh, two, uh, 425 Grand Concourse. Uh, are more and more state more and more states going to be getting into this? You, uh, some of them yes. are rewarding. Yeah, yeah. What, yeah. So, so that's that's really kind of like encouraging a trend that we're seeing right now. Uh, Massachusetts and New York State really have pioneered um, the kind of like incentive playbook. Uh, mm -hmm. First, by uh, incentivizing workforce development, then uh, direct incentives. Uh, then these competitions. Also, in the beginning, that they tried to uh, get people interested in this kind of technology and also the low income housing tax credits. But most developers report that even before those incentives, they come in at 2% additional cost. It's not that it's off offsetting it. Right. So once you get the incentives, it's a no brainer, right? And right. Uh, so that model is now moving into the Midwest. Chicago is very seriously looking that way uh, yeah. and to kind of copy it. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for this overview. You've done. Your, uh, we've got, seen some some really interesting projects here, and um, so let me ask. Um, you know, what advice you would have to our my audience, uh, our audience of our architects, engineers, contractors, and developers in in multifamily? Uh, who wants to lead it off? Katrin, you're shaking your head, so you're going to have to lead off. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm I'm just happy. You know, it's like perfect conversation. That's what we need to have. So your audience, your big five hundred. I would say, like, get into the game. Uh, it's time uh the big uh companies have not maybe they didn't need to or they didn't think they needed to i, I think i think it's time for them to come up to speed uh, so, the, and, uh, so the, the, our giants 500 uh that we have at, at building design and construction it, it, it's not just lead anymore we should be thinking about uh, getting exactly. your people with their cphc credentials and so forth and uh, and and doing some buildings sloan and christoph what what advice do you have what did you learn that uh, oh gosh i wish we'd done that a little bit better or uh whew. <laughs> well, we, I mean, we 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 started doing this about ten years ago, and mm -hmm. at that time things were different, and it was somewhat difficult, and there weren't enough people doing it, and it hadn't been proven in our market, so we didn't really know. But we've sort of been up that steep learning curve, and it's it's not that difficult, and architects and engineers and consultants can figure it out, um, as well as subcontractors, and so it's actually not that difficult to execute on. And the interesting thing is, like, this is where the if you you know skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it is, this is where things are headed. And if you want to future proof your investments, your buildings, um, you know, this is definitely the place to be. We've seen capital um, asking for this now, which is really interesting. Mm, um, large capital sources, institutional capital saying, we want to be in multifamily passive house buildings. Great. What do you got? Christoph. So I think, I think this um, is the place to be. Got Christoph, I'll let you wrap it up. Well, um, I, I can just second that what uh, Sloan is reporting. Um, we need to really reduce uh, risk in our uh, assets uh, for the future. The biggest risk is uh, climate and, and operating cost utility rates. And Passive House uh, catches both of these uh, and then has the additional benefit of um, health. Um, so it can't get any better. The added cost right now may be added cost. I don't even think it's really at a cost. And I think it's going to completely peter out in two or three years. There's no no difference between a standard building and, and what we're promoting here because that's going to be the standard building for any investment to have in a, a, a developer. Great. Well, we've been talking to a, a distinguished group here today. Katrin Klingenberg uh, is the executive director and co-founder of FIUS, uh, the Passive House Institute US. Christoph Stump, uh, Stump, who is the vice president of design and construction at Trinity Financial. And Sloan Ritchie, uh, president of Cascade Built in Seattle. Thanks for your time and uh, for your interesting conversation. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thanks for having us.